Um, I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Ross Strader from Stanford and Cole Shaw from MIT. Um, they're going to be talking this really cool project, uh, semantic tagging in, X in edX. Um, so take it away, guys. Thanks, Serena. Uh, so I'm, I'm Ross. Uh, I'll start off today. Uh, just to give you a quick overview, uh, what we're talking about today uh, relies on a new uh, feature in edX uh, that is almost, but not quite done, we'll talk about that a little bit more later, uh, called XBlock Asides. Uh, I'll show uh, some example use cases of Asides, uh, talk about uh, uh, the OLI, uh, OLI's Open Learning Initiative at Stanford, and some MIT use cases uh, that we're working on specifically. We'll give a little demo, and we're attempting a live tech demo today, so fingers crossed. Um, and then uh, talk about some next steps for Asides. So jumping in, uh, just out of curiosity, who here has heard of Asides? Okay, that's kind of about what I figured. It's been, uh, it's been a couple mentions on the Google group. Uh, essentially, an Aside is a new feature that edX has been working on that is, is basically an X-Block decorator. It allows you to associate various sorts of metadata with existing X-Blocks. Um, new X-Blocks that you might come up with as well as ones that are built into the platform. Um, I think key to this feature is that it's uh, pluggable using the same extension mechanism that X-Blocks themselves use, so it's very easy for somebody who is uh, familiar with Xbox to um, get into the architecture and create an aside. Um, and then another key point is that uh, you can have multiple asides decorate a single X block. And this doesn't, it's, it's a lot easier to show you what I mean than to talk through this. So here's a, a few different use cases. These are mocked up, these don't exist yet, just to show you what this might be used for. Um, for example, in this screenshot here of this problem, you can see up in the, uh, the title bar there, the, the top uh, gray bar where it says difficulty low. Uh, so one use case would be to tag uh, problem components by difficulty. And you can imagine that using the, uh, the new content libraries that edX has, uh, having uh, different banks of problems tagged you know, easy, medium, and hard, and then being able to construct assessments where you pull you know, three easy problems, five medium, and two hard, for example. Uh, another one would be to add an upvoting or downvoting aside. Uh, to, uh, to components. Um, so again, you know, ideally choose the kind of component that you want or, or any component to be able to decorate it with that and uh, store and, and look at those uh, results. Uh, another use case might be social media. Um, we've talked about that before in edX, being able to uh, share a specific problem or, or uh, uh, component type uh, with your friends. So um, what we're really excited about is more along the lines of the first one. Uh, that Asides really becomes an enabler for tagging. Uh, so I mentioned the, the first the bullet here, the, you know, tagging by difficulty level of a problem, but there's other tags that you can imagine as well. Um, one of the kinds of tags that we're both very interested in uh, is learning objectives. So being able to tag all kinds of components by their learning objective in the course, and I'll show, um, we'll get into more detail about how we're using those in a few minutes. Uh, but you can imagine uh, all kinds of metadata needed for advanced analytics as Insights grows. Um, Gabe's doing great work on, on, on Insights as that uh, proceeds. Being able to tag different components with metadata that you can use to analyze uh, student work in different ways. Um, I mentioned along the lines of the difficulty level, having large reusable problem banks tagged you know, either by difficulty or by uh, you know, some other dimension. Um, some of this will feed into the uh, adaptive learning experiences that people are starting to work on. So um, giving students different pathways through a course uh, depending on what they've done in the course and, and showing them different kinds of content tagged different ways. Um, obviously uh, authorship and copyright and licensing information is, uh, is a piece of metadata that is um, often important to be able to include with a component. Um, improve content management. Imagine going into the files and upload section of the course and actually being able to sort by, for example, learning objective or some other tag that you put in there. Being able to, to tag things and then, and then sort all of the assets that you have with the course. Um, and finally, uh, and this kind of builds off analytics, but as we get into more uh, you know, granular pedagogical research, to be able to tag components with something, even behind the scenes, even in a way that students or instructors don't see, but that allow us to do more research um, into how students are using the platform and what they're learning, and really using this, uh, the, the platform, as, as edX always says, to do research into how students learn. So there's a lot of, uh, of promise here, I think. Um, again, you know, generally in terms of what you can do with the sides and then specifically with uh, different sorts of tagging. 
Um, I'll talk now, I have a couple of slides on what we're doing uh, at OLI at Stanford, and then Cole has a couple of slides uh, about uh, MIT. Um, we're a, a, a research project at Stanford um, that is working on uh, some, what we're calling outcome-based analytics. And I apologize, you'll hear me use the words learning objective or learning outcome interchangeably. I mean the same thing. Um, I, I know sometimes they mean different things to different people, but I'm not one of those people. So uh, I may say outcome or learning objective. Um, but we're interested in uh, modeling the student's knowledge state uh, in order to predict their level of mastery um, by a given learning objective or outcome. So instead of only looking at what the student's doing in the course, we're actually trying to take that performance data and feed it into a statistical model to actually predict their level of, of learning uh, along that, uh, that dimension. Um, the model takes uh, two main inputs. Um, one is the, the student performance on the problems that comes from the log data. And then the other is this association map where we have um, problem components uh, tagged with a learning objective. And we actually use a, a two-level hierarchy. And we have learning objectives and then we have sub-objectives or skills. Um, and that becomes important when we do the, the demo call. We'll actually show how you would uh, create objectives and skills and, and tag problems in the course with, uh, with those skills. Um, so this is kind of a, a rough map of what I just said. We start down here at the bottom left. We have uh, the student performance in the course, along with uh, what's an XML-based uh, map of learning objectives to resource IDs or problem IDs. Uh, and this is where, you know, right now this is constructed by hand, but we really want to be able to use Studio for, uh, for content authors, instructors, as they create new problems to be able to tag them with existing objectives or skills or to create new objectives or skills and, and make that association right there. Uh, and then we have a, uh, uh, the model is represented in the middle there. When I, I uh, did a Google image search for something representing an algorithm, I, I found Sheldon and I had to use Sheldon's, Sheldon's algorithm. I think that's a relationship algorithm if I remember right. Anyway, the model predicts student mastery uh, for a given learning objective and then uh, we'll feed into a dashboard display, for example, for instructors that shows how the students in the class are doing uh, uh, for each learning objective. Uh, it can also feed into uh, different displays for students or maybe into the platform in ways that aren't necessarily a display, um, but would help guide students through the course depending on what they're doing, what the model knows about, you know, what they know now and what they need to know next. Uh, so that's OLI. Let me turn it over to Cole who will talk about MIT and then actually show you a demo of what we've got uh, working so far. Thanks, Ross. Um, so, a lot of the things that we're looking at at MIT, um, where we would use tagging, um, there's a big institutional focus right now on modularity. Um, so, we haven't, module is kind of a squishy term, um, but a module you can imagine is something that is smaller than a full blown course, but more than just say a video or a single problem or an HTML page, right? Um, and there's, there's this push to say, if I have this module of content, um, in what different contexts can I use this content? Right? Maybe I can use it residentially for my students at, uh, for Open edX platform, um, MITx, and maybe I can also reuse it in my MOOC and tweak it a little bit, or maybe I can later on um, tweak it a little more and use it in my professional education courses. Right? And so once you have these modules, how can you reuse them in, in different ways? Um, but in order to define a module, you need to know what is all this content teaching, and is it teaching to this kind of the same bordered uh, topic? Um, and so that's one of our use cases for being able to tag content and associate it with learning outcomes. And then once you have these modules, um, we want to be able to offer students um, different pathways through them. So all the knowledge builds on each other. Um, we have concept maps um, now through quite a few of our courses. And um, so you can imagine helping guide students through, through modules or through certain pathways, um, as long as you know um, which outcomes they each teach and then how these outcomes build upon each other to create kind of a higher foundation of knowledge. <coughs> Another, another similar use case is we are now offering tools to our freshmen who come in which are learning outcome based resources. So um, these, are, these are resources that have been curated by our faculty and they're organized by learning outcome or learning topic. Um, and so for students who move on um, as sophomores and juniors and seniors, they might need to remember something that they learned in their freshman year, right? Um, and it's, it's very kind of vague to tell them, well you learned this in your introductory calculus course, but what does that mean? I still don't know how to apply the chain rule. Um, and students have expressed to our faculty that it's, of course, very simple to Google and try and find pages um, that are related to the chain rule, but 
it'd be nice if there were sort of a curated resource where they know these are the high quality content, I don't need to waste my time filtering through and looking through the web to try and find things that can help me. Um, and currently this tool points to things that are on like Wikipedia, Wolfram Alpha, and MIT OpenCourseWare. And uh, it would be nice if we could point to things like Open edX courses or Open edX modules, or content that has also been created and reused now in this other context for our students. Um, so one of the big barriers that we've always seen with tagging is that it's not a super um, exciting task to do. Um, one of the benefits, I think, of MOOCs is that um, they forced all of the course uh, instructors and curators to be a lot more structured up front. And so people now have to actually plan out their courses very, in a very detailed fashion and know which each piece of content, what is, what is the teaching goal, and what do you expect students to master at the end of it. Um, but that, that knowledge is often lost after the course is, is run. And people don't, it's hard to motivate people to go back afterwards and retag things. Um, and so the goal is to create kind of the most convenient way possible um, and the lowest barrier to people tagging this content while they're authoring the course. Um, so for us, it, it makes sense to try and integrate something in the studio, um, and a slide seems like the perfect way to do that. Um, so we'll show a little demo. Um, it is kind of a hack that hopefully never makes it into edX, um, but the core asides code actually exists currently in the platform, and the hack is really just to get it to render in studio um, and to be able to show you kind of what it would look like. So this is my dev stack. Um, one of the things you'll notice, um, I have two multiple, uh, sorry, two problems, multiple choice on a custom JavaScript, and also an HTML text block. Um, the one thing that is not standard in Studio is the skills button. So you'll see the skills button appear on the HTML, the skills button on the custom JavaScript, and also skills button on the multiple choice block. Um, and the thing to note is these are all the same lightweight asides. Um, I did not have to create like a taggable problem X block, right, or taggable HTML X block. Um, it's just this little side that I've configured on DevStack to render on problems in HTML across the board. Um, and so tagging is an interesting thing where there's lots of different ways in which you can imagine tagging content. Um, probably the most um, basic or the one that comes to mind most readily is um, just freeform tagging, right? You type into a text box, um, a suggested uh, list of suggestions will come up, and then you pick one. Um, like if you use Stack Overflow or any sort of kind of these question services, um, you see it all the time, right? Um, and as Ross mentioned, both OLI and MIT, we have a little more structured sense of learning outcomes. And so, um, what you'll see in our, in our um, preview is um, there is this high-level learning outcome. And then under each learning outcome, you will have a set of skills. Um, so if I pick one, these are from a stati statistics course. Set of objectives or outcomes. Sorry, outcomes. Yeah, if I pick an outcome, thanks. Um, you'll see a set of... Um, skills that apply to that outcome that I can then tag to my resources, right? So on the left is things that are available from the pool of outcomes that we've predefined. Um, and then when I click one over onto the right, my left, your right, um, these are skills that are now applied to the problem, the specific multiple choice problem in my course. Um, and it's fed behind the scenes to the OLI analytics engine so that whenever a student um, attempts the problem, they can do their magic and figure out, you know, how well has the student mastered the outcome or the objective. And part of the goal is also through this interface, um, you can create your own. So if I'm creating a course and I decide that none of these outcomes or skills really apply to this problem that I've created, um, I can create a new outcome. This is like my custom. And it will slowly turn the bits. Um, and it will then, hopefully, show up in the list of things. And you can also create your own skills to add to it. So I can say this is um, skill one is to juggle while eating. Um, easy to do. Um, as the bits keep turning, you can now apply this to your skill. And now um, we can see how well the students do at this skill when they answer this question. Um, one thing to note is that nothing actually shows up for this aside on the student side. This is all kind of behind the scenes administrative. Um, we can also kind of imagine how this aside might show up on the student side. So there are, uh, there's an MIT faculty who, who runs a MOOC um, and he actually manually, they manually put at the top of each subsection or unit kind of the list of outcomes that they expect students to be able to master after this section of the course. Right, but they do it manually. Um, it would be nice if, if you could say go through and tag all the, all the components and have an aside that rolls it all up for you and shows it to the students. Right? So you can imagine quite a lot of things you can do with tagging 
both on the student side and on the instructor side. Um, so I'll turn it back over to Ross to wrap up. So we're really excited about this. Um, at, uh, in the LLI courses uh, previously on the old platform we were using, uh, we had some nice dashboard displays that really served as a good carrot. You know, as Cole said, it's often uh, hard to get uh, people as they're creating content to go in and, and create those learning objectives, but being able to see those dashboards and how students were, uh, were doing per objective uh, provided a big carrot to actually doing that work. But then to actually sit down and do that work, we were just using a Google spreadsheet that had you know, problem IDs and learning objective and skill. Um, so to be able to, uh, to tag these in the platform, especially as a uh, faculty or content author is creating a, a, a new learning objective and some new content, to be able to create new problem types and come up with the objectives right there and, and enter those um, as they work, we think is a huge improvement to the um, uh, process. Uh, so I want to talk, we have a couple more slides, uh, but just a little bit on the status of the sides. Um, Kale uh, had, done, had uh, done some great work in getting this started and doing the underlying functionality. Um, as Cole mentioned, um, it needs a little bit more to, to finish it off and make it available in, uh, in Studio and the LMS. So the initial work is there. Um, it doesn't yet render in Studio or in the LMS, but it does in the workbench. So if you see something here that you're excited by and want to go play with it and try it out, you can download the XBlock Workbench and, and they work there. And that's a screenshot uh, there of the uh, upvoting or downvoting working um, in Workbench. Um, and then I know there are some, uh, some upcoming um, features in edX that I think will rely on a side. So I think that's, I'm not sure if it's on the roadmap yet, but hopefully soon will be. And, and uh, we'll be off and running. Um, and then just as the last slide, to throw out some thoughts on uh, what we've seen from uh, playing with this so far is, is the, the big points that are still needed. Um, right now, when you, when you turn on the side, it's on for that instance of edX. Right? So we want to, uh, obviously, you want to be able to turn that on in our per course. Um, while you can have multiple sides show up for every X block in a course, you might not want to have all of them show up for every X block in a course. Uh, so to be able to configure that. Uh, also, I wanted to mention that um, what Cole and I both showed for the OLI use case and the MIT use case um, are uh, or involves um, tagging a uh, component um, that is fed by a, a learning objective service. That wouldn't always be the case. You can imagine lots of use cases where you want to be able to associate tags and store them locally with a course. Um, and so being able to configure how those tags are stored uh, would also be key. Um, and then obviously being able to display them to instructors and students, uh, work on how they're rendering in the course. And then finally there's uh, some platform configuration tweaks needed currently to enable a size. And I think as, as these get finished off then that'll, that'll get smoothed out as well. Um, but yeah, we're, we're excited about it. We've, uh, I think the underlying functionality is there and um, uh, is, is successful and, and uh, so we're, we're excited to see it done. Hopefully next year we can show the, the finished product. Okay, that's all we had, so we're happy to answer any questions. Um, yeah. Can you explain the semantics behind the modified semantic and the semantic okay. tagging? I'm sorry, explain. Can you explain the semantics behind the word semantic and the tagging? Oh, uh, yeah, good question. Uh, you, you, you repeat that, you repeat the question. Yeah. yeah. So the question, if I understood you right, was um, explain the semantics behind the word semantic tagging. Uh, so I'm sorry, that's something that we use at OI that uh, I probably should uh, not use without uh, explaining, but it just uh, uh, essentially means tagging um, the problems or the resources in the course according to the, the objective that, to, to which they correspond. So that uh, it, it, I think it's meaningful tagging, um, basically. So importing, I'm not sure how that would work currently with Studio, or that's supported. Beth is shaking her head, so I assume no. Um, in Workbench, you can actually configure it. So you can configure the XML for an aside, just like you would for like an XBlock. So you can configure the XML tag that comes out to be whatever you want it to be. I assume as long as it doesn't conflict with OLX. The question...
the question for the video was how does this uh, relate to OLX? Is it stored with OLX? And it may also depend, like I said, on on uh, on that configuration storage, right? So if you have tags that are stored with a the course, then presumably that's going to end up in OLX somewhere. Although okay, I don't know if it does now. But uh, I think in, in our case, we have um, for our statistics course, for example, we have one instance or one course that may have 100 instances of use. And so we're trying to figure out, we want to have some uh, learning objectives and skills that are associated with the course, but then also have instructors have the ability to add new ones. And so where is that line? Like we have this learning objective service that kind of feeds this that we need for the analytics. We can't store everything with the course, but there may be some local storage for, for sort of custom uses. Anyway, uh, we're, we're thinking through all that. Serena. Um, this is really cool. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm curious because you mentioned that it's visible in the workbench. If you have any like tutorials or sample Xbox with size enabled or anything, to like how would I go to the workbench and start playing? Yeah, good question. Uh, so the question was, uh, it's available on Workbench now. Um, are there examples, tutorials to how to set this up and, and get working? I think you um, know more. So there are two that are currently part of the Workbench. Um, there is an asset aside, which is used for all of the automated testing, I think. And then there's um, the thumbs up, thumbs down is also included in the Workbench. So you can use that as a model and kind of build off of it. Oh, ah, thank you. Um, and so I, I uh, am supposed to advertise <laughs> a meeting of the Adaptive uh, Working Group, Adaptive Learning Working Group, that will be um, on Wednesday at noon. And if you're interested in coming to that, participating, we'd love to have you. It's, uh, we just got started, and there's really some interesting use cases and some uh, good energy behind that right now. Uh, so talk to Beth, or uh, you can talk to me as well uh, to get more details. But um, we'd love to see you Wednesday at noon. Uh, every other Wednesday, but tomorrow is or two. This one, this Wednesday yeah. is one. Yeah, so meet this Wednesday, and then it's every other Wednesday. But not in person. It's virtual. It's virtual. Yeah. <laughs> virtual. Do online, thanks. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you.